So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for another one of the Siemens webinars. Today we're going to be exploring a very interesting and I think relevant topic, what we refer to as uh, measure cut measure. So really seeing if we can start to utilize our probes to kind of advance our manufacturing process. So I am going to be actually your moderator today, so I will introduce you guys to our guest presenter here shortly. But uh, just for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with me, my name is Chris Pollock. I am the manager of our uh, application center as well as um, do a lot of work in our international business development. But um, more, um, probably more useful to you, I certainly can be a resource for a lot of the topics within the Cinemark Control from an operation and programming standpoint. Uh, additionally, Siemens is a pretty large company, as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, so uh, even just getting you to maybe the right person to talk to. So there's my contact information. Uh, probably best way to get a hold of me certainly would be email. Uh, so with that being said, do you guys have any questions, you need a hand, shoot me an email, and I would be happy to try to assist any way I can. So before we get into the primary topic, I did want to make sure that everybody on the call is aware of some uh, resources that I think could be very useful to you, certainly from the perspective of operation and programming topics, which is really what we um, tend to uh, focus on from my team's side. So CNC for you. So you can see the URL in the upper left hand corner. That is our main landing page. That is our primary website. Uh, really all things um, end user centric or operation programming centric. So some of the things you're going to see there, uh, we do have all of our webinars, upcoming webinars are promoted there. More importantly, links to all of our legacy or our past webinars are there. Uh, I think to date we've done over 70 webinars. There is a there's a lot of information out there if you're looking for support on the cinema control. Uh, so check out scenes for you, kind of explore it. You're going to see all kinds of neat stuff. Um, we do also have training classes available there. Uh, and we do offer two different types of training. So we have online or in person. But what's important to note with our online or in-person training, this is all instructor-led. So obviously in-person would be instructor-led. We're not going to have you sit in a room by yourself. Um, but our online is as well instructor-led. So these are multi-day courses. You go to the website, you can take a look at what courses are coming up. We actually have a shop term one starting uh, just, uh, just next week. So they are um, complimentary. Um, for sure, you know, if you guys are going to spend time working with us, uh, we want to we want to make sure that we can help you any way we can. Uh, we're not looking to profit off this. We're just looking to try to help increase your knowledge of, of our product. Um, so check out the the different classes. Uh, here would be some of the in-person trainings. Again, it's the same scenario. You can kind of see an overview of the classes. We have been focusing more on our advanced technology on our in-person classes. Uh, it was challenging certainly with COVID and everything that was going on, getting the classes um, started again. Um, but uh, for, um, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten them going, we got them rolling. Um, I see Jack was asking uh, if there's classes near him. Uh, so the in-person classes at this stage are only offered in our Elk Grove Village, Illinois facility. Um, a lot of these advanced topics, we need the hardware available to us. So for argument's sake, the uh, level 3.5x class, we actually get on a machine, we work on a machine. Uh, so it's a little more, more difficult to host classes regionally. So all the classes, the in-person training will be in the Illinois region, right? Um, we're like 10 minutes from the O'Hare Airport, if you're familiar with that. Another resource that uh, that you can find with a whole host of information is our Mr. CNC YouTube channel. So Mr. CNC is our primary um, kind of um, suppository, shall we say, for all of our videos. Um, so if you're on the CNC View page and you see a, a link to a webinar, it will go to the Mr. CNC, the YouTube channel. But we do do a lot of additional videos that you won't find in some of these other websites. Uh, we do a YouTube live series, which uh, I tend to drive most of them, which I really enjoy. Uh, get a chance to actually work with the technology live. Usually they're about a half hour segment. We do a lot of little mini 
promotional videos or how-to videos that just focus on a very small topic, try to keep them five minutes or less whenever we can. We want to increase the frequency of this content. Um, so check out the channel if you haven't been on it. Please like it, share it, and most importantly, subscribe to it. Um, by you guys subscribing, by you guys liking the content, by you guys sharing it, it shows our headquarters the uh, validity and the need for this material, and it's just going to allow us to do more and more. Uh, so by all, by all means, please promote it wherever, um, wherever feasible. And give you an idea, this was uh, a video we had uh, done recently on thread milling. I do try to partner with technology partners wherever I can. That one I did with OSG. I've done some stuff with Big Kaiser. We're looking to expand uh, to some other technology partners. I think we're going to do some stuff with Walter coming up. So check it out. Now, with that being said, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a colleague of mine, Dan Strubel. Dan, are you there? Remember to unmute yourself. Ah, there he is. So, so Dan works for me, and he's a uh, relatively new member of the team. You've been with us for about uh, six months now. Well, actually, seven months, right? Because you started first of the year, so it's easy yeah. to to know uh, kind of when you started. So, Dan is coming to us with a wealth of knowledge. Been in the machine tool industry for what over twelve years now, I think. 12, 14 years, something like that. Uh, he's worked for a few different OEMs. He's worked for some end users, done a lot in the medical side, certainly plenty of aerospace work and advanced technology work. So, uh, so Dan is uh, going to be a huge asset. Uh, this is his first webinar. So uh, go easy on them. <laughs> now you don't have to, you can beat them up. But uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give it over to Dan here. And Dan is going to get into the measure, cut, measure topic. So one second, I'm going to stop sharing. Right. Okay, Dan, so you should have control at this point. Yep. Share away. Everyone got my... We got it. It looks great. Screen. Just want to make sure I get the chat over here in case any questions pop up. I'll, um, so just for the audience, like we typically do these, I'll monitor the chat. So don't you worry about it. Uh, also the Q and a window, we will do the standard Q and a at the end, but you know, with me being the moderator, sometimes I can see a question that comes in that's appropriate at a given time. So don't hold back. If you guys have a question, type it in. Uh, if I can jump in and interrupt Dan, I will, if not, we'll go through them at the end. So with that being said. Dan, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the introduction. Thanks for kind of covering the first couple of the topics about some of the resources that we have available to everyone. But what I really wanted to do and wanted to talk about when I first started with Chris is kind of come up with an idea of what I've been doing for the last couple of years is cutting a lot of parts and a lot of machines and something that always comes up when we, we talk about that is measure, cut, measure. What is measure, cut, measure? Measure cut measure is where we're going to probe a feature or a datum on a part, and we're going to relay that to a work offset or a tool offset. So we can update a tool offset, we can update a work offset. So it's something where really we can utilize that that touch probe to really pick up a feature, measure it, and then update the tool. And a lot of what you'll see is we're going to go through a couple different things, but you'll see that we can actually do it inside our cycle, and we can actually do it outside our cycle. So it's really Really unique and something that, that's a theme with Siemens that Chris always usually like to tell us when we I was going through his training early on in my career is, is that Siemens gives you like 10 different ways to do one thing. So you'll see that today as we start to go through this, you, you have multiple different ways to do a measure cut measure and that really apply it to your part and your geometry. So getting into it, excuse me. We have wanted to kind of touch bases kind of what 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 controls we're going to focus on today and then what our platform has. So we have a couple different control platforms. We have a Cinemeric 808, a Cinemeric 828 and a Cinemeric 840D and then new to come, new on the street, new on the block is going to be Cinemeric 1. So with uh, entry level machines, that's going to be we're we're not really going to focus on the 808, but we'll, what two controls we're going to focus on is 828 and 840D and Cinemark One. We're going to focus on those two platforms, the standard machines and modular machines. So 
you should see that uh, if you have an 828, you're going to probably use probing a lot as, as well as the cinematic one, an 840D. So we have two different types of cycles and probing. So we have, we can either measure and set our work offsets in jogs, so like your first setup of your workpiece. And then we can also do it in automatic mode. So we can do it in process measurement or in process uh, updating our work offsets. So there's two different types, just want to kind of differentiate. So jog is going to be that one that we're going to use when we're setting up our part for the very first time and then auto. We're going to touch base on both those today. So we're going to get right into the jog mode. So it's kind of setup mode. So we're, we have our first piece. We want to talk about that for the very first time. We're going to really kind of go and dive deep into that. <laughs> Some of the system requirements, just kind of want to talk about it. Our cycles are standard on there. There's nothing really an option for that, except when we go to the A to A. And what that means is like you don't need to have the probe and necessarily to use these cycles, meaning that you can use an edge finder or a tool or an end mill, a known diameter of part. You can kind of use these cycles without a probe. But we're going to focus more on using it with the touch probe today. In an 8 to 8, you're going to need a, an option P16 for the extended functions, and we can kind of see that on the, a couple slides uh, later that we're going to. Like I said before, there's a couple different ways that you can use our cycle. So you can have a, a tool touch where we're going to actually use a tool to touch and set up uh, a workpiece. We can use man manual equipment like a, an indicator or um, an edge finder or a light up probe. Or what we're going to focus on, the biggest thing today is going to be a probe in the machine. So we can have an, either an automatic probe for the tool or a touch uh, part probe for the spindle. So this is what we're going to focus on. This is really how you take advantage of a probe on a machine where you can actually do measure cut measure. In jog mode, what you'll see is when we're setting up part, we can either set our work offset or we can do measure only. So this is kind of used nice when you're setting up your part. So you set G54 and you want to measure and make sure that you you set G54 and it's measuring correctly. You can do that too as well in jog mode. So it's really kind of really, really handy. We'll touch base on more jog functions as we go through this webinar. Like I said before, we have quite a bit of cycles that come on our machine. With that being said, the 828, you need that option of the box that are in red. Those are some more advanced cycles that you would have to put on for an 828, but these are the cycles that we have. We're gonna focus on just a few of them today to do measure, cut, measure. If you really wanted to dive deep into those cycles, this is this is kind of like this webinar that we're going through today is gonna to kind of follow, uh, follow up to the past webinar, which is probing and jog and auto. So in that webinar that we have on our YouTube channel, Mr. CNC, Chris goes through each one of those cycles in depth and really kind of shows you what each cycle is doing, how you would apply it, where you would use it. So there's there's some really good topics on, on Mr. CNC. And, and like Chris said, make sure that if you like the content, please subscribe. So now we're going to get into auto mode, automatic mode. <clears throat> so some system requirements. Again, if you got 828, you're going to need to have an option or verify that you have an option and 820 840d you're also going to need to know the option so how do you find that you go to setup licenses and then you're going to search for this license and make sure you have a checkbox the option is called p28 uh, the, the number on the screen is where you'd reference to make sure that you have that cycle that that the measuring cycles with the license so measure cut measure webinar what are we going to get through today we're going to go through auto mode probing of first off and second off. We're going to go in process measure of a feature. We're going to update a tool offset with the probe feature, and we're going to use the measure results cycle 150 and the right command. And we're going to do this on a virtual machine. So I have a virtual machine that will show live demos on here, just like you would do in the real life. And we're going to go through a real life part. So that's something we really want to touch base on. When thinking about measure cut measure, it really comes into how you're going to manufacture a part. So when you have a part and a manufactured good, there's a couple things that you really want to think about. And this is something that I've done over the last, you know, 10 plus years of my career that I've really thought about these, these types of questions. You know, we have a part, we have a manufactured good. How do we get to that manufactured good? How do we get to that end result? And some of the things you need to think about is what machine you're going to use. 
What are the tolerances of the parts so that you pick the right machine? What is the work holding that you need to make sure that you are going to achieve those tolerances? And the same thing with tooling, you know, what kind of tooling for what type of material that you are cutting? And then how are you going to hold it? Are you going to hold it with a first off with one clamp or a second off? And then the final thing, which is my favorite, is how you're going to measure it. This is my favorite because it's it's it is so unique because it's so different from just machining the part. So you, you, it's kind of front to back. You always got to think about these things. So we have our manufactured good. We have a part print. We really kind of need to know our tolerancing to kind of know what machine we're going to pick and how we're going to hold it. One of the biggest things when we start looking at measure, cut, measure, or we're going to manufacture something, we need to know our datums are. And a lot of times we kind of get hung up on, we need to clamp on that datum A, or we need to clamp on a datum. In the five axis world, or in our case, we have a five axis machine. So we're going to be able to just machine that datum instead of trying to hold on that datum. So we're going to try to get as many of the datums and features in one clamp as we possibly can. So that way, most of the tolerancing is going to come in first off and we can kind of control that with measure cut measure. So again, we're going to have to choose the right machine once we figure out our print and our dimensions and then where, how, and we're going to measure it. And then do we need to have some in process checking, meaning like, are we going to cut a little bit of the part and then measure it to make sure that we're tracking and then how we're going to finally inspect the part. Once we figure out that we're going to have to know our material and how we're, what we're going to start and how we're going to clamp it. So here we have our material size and then we need to know how we're going to set up G54 and G55. Like, how are we going to clamp and first off and how we're going to clamp and second off and then where we're going to set those G54 are offsets for our machine tool. So here we're going to set it on top of the block for our, our raw material and then we're going to pick up a hole on the second off of the finished part from first off. So some of the things that we're going to go through, and I'm going to drive the machine around and kind of show you this. We really want to kind of go through on a line edge. So one of the coolest things that I love about Siemens cycles is this cycle right here. This is like the, my favorite one because I don't know if anyone spent time setting up machines, multiple machines for an eight hour day. You are constantly tramming in vices, work pieces. So this is a cool probing routine where you just come in and hit two points and you align your C-axis. One of the caveats to using this cycle is you, 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 uh, you, you can either do it in a couple different ways and we'll show you that on the next slide. So the next slide is, this is gonna set our work offset. And it doesn't necessarily always have to have a five axis or a rotation. We can actually do a coordinate rotation. So first off the bat, we can set our work offset. We choose which one we wanna choose. In this example here, we're choosing 510. And the next one is coordinate rotation. So we can either rotate our coordinates or we can rotate the physical axis that we have on our machine, whatever kinematics. And then the next thing is parallel to an edge. So let's say that you already had a skew to the part. It's gonna follow that skew to the part. It's gonna follow that. It's gonna be parallel to that edge. Our parallel axle is basically following the kinematics of the machine. So it's gonna follow X. The measure direction is, is how you're gonna measure it. So you can either align in X, you can align in Y in the positive or negative direction. And then the positioning axis is where it's gonna move between points. Next is the angles. So like in this example, we're actually going to measure the part in two points and we're gonna set it to 20 degrees. This is just an example I'm showing you. And then and the L2 is the distance between the two points. Protection zone, the PO, pro T zone or protection zone, that's a, if you have a clamp, let's say in the, in the middle of the P1 and P2, there was a clamp there. You can kind of define that and it, the probe will move around it. Next is a DFA. DFA is a search tolerance to your point so where it's going to actually move into it. We'll go in depth when we go through the cycle and TSA is the search tolerance. The next is we're probably going to do an edge touch. Edge touch is going to set Z, right? And we want to set the Z. So for our G54 and G55, we want to know where Z is first before we go probe a hole or, or probe our edges or our rectangle. In there, in each cycle, you're going to have work offset. Again, you're going to set your, which define which one it is. Is it G54, G55, G56? Coarse or fine. So what's coarse or fine? So coarse is going to go to the course of the work offset and then fine is like an aware or fine adjustment to that course. 
So here we're setting up for the very first time. So we're probably gonna apply it to pores. Next is the direction that you're gonna do, which is we're gonna probe in Z and we wanna set zero. So one thing that's unique is here, if you wanna set it like a millimeter below the part or a hundred thou below the part, you can do that in this cycle. That's what's really nice. And then again, you'll see this a theme is we always have the distance from zero, which is the DFA, which is basically our search tolerance. And then our TSA is our, our, our max allow tolerance, meaning like how far can we search in that window? <clears throat> Next on 254 and 255, we're going to have to probably use a hole or a spigot. For the first stop, we have raw stock, so we're probably going to use a, a spigot rectangle. Here again, we're going to pick our work offset, what work offset, apply it, play it to the course, and then we're going to define our width and our length. Angle to start, you're going to start your start angle where you want to start it at, and then how deep you're going to go is the DZ protection zone again if you have some clamps in the way it's going to lift and go around it and dfa is going to follow true it's it's the search tolerance from where you are and then and then the tsa is the max amount of tolerance so this is just for searching for for when the probe is actually going to start to measure so here is our example and a, a software that we're going to use today which is called create my virtual machine and this is a, a physical this is a virtual machine that anything that the physical machine can do we can do physically here so this is kind of be a live demo where we're going to actually go through this so this is where we're going to go through a jog and we're going to set up our first stop with our raw stock and then our, our second stop of our finished part from first stop once we set our G54 and G55, we know those positions and we have those work offsets in our machine, we can apply an auto probing routine. Some would call this a macro or probing macro. Here, we're gonna use those same cycles that we used in job, but we're gonna put them in a part program. What, what that benefits us is we can actually, every time that we load a part in first off and we load a part in second off, we can pick those parts up again without having to bring the, the probe out or an indicator or an edge finder or anything like that or have a part stopped we can just run this program and it'll pick up g54 every single time and g55 so in that first one we're going to go through first stop we're going to we're going to use an edge touch for z and then we're going to use a rectangle spigot to pick up our g54 and g55 and, and z x y next is second op we have a finished part. So in finished part, you know, we, we probably want to line an edge. So every single time that that part might skew just a little bit in that fixture, that second op fixture, depending on the tolerance thing and the pins it sits on. So we're probably going to line that edge. So we're going to use a line edge first, and then we're going to use an edge touch to set Z, and then we're going to pick up X and Y with a hole. So we were going to use this in an auto function. So next is we're going to go through this in a live setting. So I'm going to bring up my machine here. And here's here's what I talked about. So this is our, our, our new software. It's called Create My Virtual Machine. And this is our TAC machine that we have in the TAC and Elk Grove. And we're going to actually show you here virtually what we could do physically on the machine. So right now, I got my probe in the spindle, right? And I have it above my part. So I've already picked up this, but we're going to kind of go through kind of jog. So you would jog to roughly about the the center of your raw stock here, right? And you would, now you would start to pick up your part. So the very first thing is you're gonna go to measure workpiece. You call up the probe in the spindle, make sure the probe's in the spindle. And the next thing you're gonna go to is measure workpiece. And this is where we're gonna measure the first workpiece. So we're doing a work offset, so we're gonna set G54 and we're gonna cycle start it. Once we cycle start, we're gonna, oh, I actually picked X, not Z. So we're going to cycle start again. We're going to pick up Z. So once we pick up Z, we're good to go. We have it. And then, like I said before, we're going to use a rectangle spigot. And as you can see, we don't have that cycle here, right? What this vertical soft key is here is what you've been previously been using. It's like kind of like a quick key. It kind of remembers. So here, we're going to pick up a hole, but in this drop down, you have all our cycles here. So we're going to pick rectangle spigot. And then here, we're going to go through standard measurement. We're going to set G54, our length and width of our part, and then how far from where we are down. And we're going to set X and Y zero. So we're going to set that. So as soon as you set this, now we know where that is and we can start to build our probe 
macro in in our part program so that we can run this every single time we run we put a raw stock in there so in case that raw stock is shifting in z or if it's shifting in x and y this is something that you can kind of use okay so it set it we're a little off in x a little off in y a little bit and you can kind of see this uh, right here in this we're going to talk about this later but there's this nice button right here because we're, we're going to talk about jog mode and measure this this is if you click this button right here it will output a report and we'll touch base on this later in the webinar but this is a nice little thing so if you're continually choosing jog for setups and you want to kind of know where things are at you can hit this measure report button and it kind of gives you a lot of details this is kind of a cool button we'll kind of show you more things about that later down the road so we set up p54 which is beautiful now we know where that is and we can verify that one more time so we can jog away from it in x and y and we have g54 set and we can go back to those positions right and cycle start there we go so we have g54 set one of the things is is now we want to set G55. I've already done that so that I can save time trying to jog the machine around. So we're going to just go to G55 and activate that work offset. And we're going to show you how you would do the jog function there. So we have G55 set. What's really cool about this software, and you probably wouldn't do this on the machine, but what I just want to show is that you can really start to drive this machine around and really kind of check yourself. So one of the things you probably wouldn't want to do is three moves in one, right? And it's going to show you that, oh, we would have crashed there if we did that. So this is kind of the cool thing about the software. I was talking with Chris earlier today, and I've been playing with this for the last week, and I was he was helping me clear the collisions because I've collided this thing so much just playing around with it here. So it's kind of unique. But back to the webinar, we want to align the edge here, right? <clears throat> so one of the biggest things is, is this part might move in this, this second op picture, right? And we want to probably align the edge that we machined in first on. So we have, we know that this is machined already, so we can come up and pick that. So one of the things that you probably want to do is, is, is drive the probe down over here, right? So we're going to move in Y, come down in Z, right? And then we're gonna make sure that we're on our edge. So we have to come over and X a little bit. Come down a lot, just a little bit more. I slow down a little bit. So once we know that we're on that edge, right? Now we can go to that line edge. So measure workpiece, a line edge, and then we're gonna pick a line edge. And we're gonna do it in the Y positive, so Y positive here. And we're going to do a coordinate rotation. You can either do C axis or B axis. Here it's going to be C because we could use we can use C axis. We want to see it in the physical, but we're going to pick coordinate rotation, and we're going to set G fifty five, right? And so we're going to cycle start, right? And it's going to set point one, right? The next one is we're going to drive the machine in the positive direction, and that's we're going to take another hit, okay? So we've taken that hit, we got two points. So I've been using this function a lot. And what I always recommend, and I'm gonna do it in this virtual machine is, I'm gonna pull up in, in Z, okay? And I'll show you why. So once you pull up in Z, right, if you were using the rotation of the axis, it would ask you if you want to rotate it. So here we're just gonna set work offset. It just did it. And, I, and it applied to zero value because I've already measured this once. And we can go see that there's going to be a little bit of applied to that C. But if you chose here the rotation of C, it's going to move the physical machine. So really the big thing there is I always teach everyone we're going to move that probe out of the way so we don't break that stylus. But once we've we've picked up the align edge, we know that, that we're square to that part, right? We're going to probably want to pick up Z or X and Y. So again, I've already done this. So I'm just going to drive the machine to save time so we can get into the measure cut measure of the topic here. So we're going to drive to that. And then I think it's going to be negative 13. 
and then we're going to come down in Z and we're going to align the edge. So once we come into and we get a known position for G54 and G55, we can start to construct our backfill program. So you see we're getting close to the part. It's kind of letting us know we're getting close to the part. So now we can go back to measure workpiece, Z touch. We can cycle start that and we're going to set our Z. To set our Z, we feel a little bit of discrepancy from the last time I touched it. And then we're going to go into zero, zero and like we'll start that to the center of the hole and it's probably go down minus six below the surface for the stylus. And then we're going to do again, we're going to pick up this. So you would drive the machine roughly to that spot if you didn't know where the, where the part was. And then you would use this again. See, we don't see a hole here. So we we'll just pick one of them because that's the last one we use. And we're going to use one hole. And then here, it's a standard measurement. We're going to use G55 and we're going to set the hole, which we know is going to be 24 millimeters from our print. Contact angle, that's going to be if you had something or you wanted to start at a different angle. And then we're going to set X and Y. Once we set, we'll start that. We're going to measure the hole. And now we have set G54 and G55 in jog mode. Okay. So we set our part, we got G55. Now the next biggest thing is we want to automate this. We want to make sure that we can use when we replace the raw stock here, that we can probe that raw stock. And when we replace the first op part into the second op fixture, that we can utilize the probe to make sure that the work offsets are tracking. So how do we do that? We're gonna do a little macro program. So we're gonna to come to here. And we're going to open up. I've already created these so we can kind of save some time. So the very first one is we're going to do first op, right? And I'll just kind of take you through what I did here. So just so that it looks like we got a bunch of hieroglyphics at the top of the program. So all I did is I defined some different variables. And in the defining the variables, I can derive the home position of the machine. And then from there, I can use that to apply to my, my supas. And then I'm going to tool change in the probe. So I'm going to tool change in the probe. So I've created some variables, got a safety line, did some cancellations, and then I'm driving the machine to my home position. I defined my variables. I've tool changed in the probe, and then I S pause. So some machine tool builders will want an S pause. What S pause is is on a Siemens machine, we we see the spindle as an axis. We can drive to any angle on the axis. And here we're basically saying we're going to lock the machine at zero, the spindle at zero. So we're saying it's zero. So if we were going to feed in a G1 mode, it would feed because we know we've told the spindle, we're not going to spin it. You're at a position of zero. And that's basically what the S pause is doing here. The next, we're going to drive to X and Y zero that we picked up with our jog function with the pro. And we're going to come down in 10, 10 millimeters above the part. When we're going to go right into the cycle, 978, we're going to do a Z touch. Again, we're going to set the work offset, G54, and we're going to go course. And we're setting the Z in the negative direction. We want zero, and we're doing a search of 10 millimeters. So our, our part can, can fluctuate 10 millimeters and we'll pick it. So that's really the coolest thing. So if you're seeing some indiscrepancies with your raw stock, you can kind of put it here and you can have that Z touch. So it's gonna be really important for that next move, right? Because if you are seeing some big swings in your raw stock, you can kind of pick that inconsistencies up. And then in this cycle, you can, before you go into the next cycle, you can reposition the probe. So you're seeing those inconsist inconsistencies. We're in a virtual world, so we're gonna stay at 10 millimeters right when we retract the part. So now we're going to pick up the X and Y. We're going to use rectangle spigot, G54. We're going to do the course. We're going to come down in our, our width, our length. We're going to start at a zero angle. We're going to go down in 18 millimeters from where we are. Again, if I said if, if I said yes here, it would show you on the screen that we have maybe some things in the way that we want to make sure we can get around. We don't have that here. And then our search tolerance is gonna be one millimeter, one millimeter. Once we do that, we're setting G54. So we're gonna send the machine to my home position I've created with my variables and then tool change out the probe. So that's pretty much done for G55. So if we ran that, we executed this, it's gonna 
gonna go home, come to the the part, probe them V, probe an X and Y. And it's not T zeroed out, so it's okay. Carrying on to second op, same thing. Wrote some variables to set a home position for the machine, did a safety line, some cancels, drove the machine home, full change the probe in, set the spindle to zero. Now here, because we set the spindle, I'm gonna drive to a location and take that first point from my line edge, and then I'm gonna bring the Z down. And once here, now we're gonna go into our line edge inside the part program. So similar to what we did in JOG, now it's in a part program. We're gonna set the work offset. We're gonna do a coordinate rotation. Here we would be either coordinate or C axis, right? Now parallel axle, we're gonna follow the machine kinematics. We're gonna do an Y positive measure and we're gonna use X as our driving axis to the next position. And we're gonna go 50 millimeters apart. We have no clamp in the way. And we're gonna do search times of two millimeters, okay? We're gonna lift up, then we're gonna go over to the edge of the part to set our Z, right? Like just we did before, we're gonna set our, our Z, T55 course, Z, and we're gonna do some search tolerance of 10 again. And then we're gonna drive to the center of a hole, right? We're gonna go up and we're gonna go down into the hole and then we're gonna measure a hole just like we did in JOG. So again, we're just following this and we're putting it into a program and we're using those same cycles in JOG to set our work offset. We execute this, it's gonna tool change the probe in, come down and hit two points. Come over and hit Z, measure our hole. And now we've sent G54 and G55 and we've used the program. Now, why is this important and why would we use this? We can use this as a, 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 a macro in our probing. So I'm using, this bike program is my main program here. And as you can see, I'm calling a bunch of programs, right? And in that, I can actually put the probe program in here, right? I can I can add those for first stop. So I can put that probe program right here and run this and it will run all those. So I can X call the, the program. So how would I do that? I'd come in various sub programs and I'd find that probe. So I got my probe folder here, my first stop, because this is my first stop machining programs. And I say, okay to that. So now when I run this program, it's gonna run that probe program and pick up my raw stock. So if I added a raw stock every single time to that, then I would I would machine it. So that's really the kind of the coolest thing there, right? <clears throat> Any questions so far? A lot of questions. Uh, why don't we just we'll throw a couple at you and then we can certainly save some for the end as well um, okay. so one of the questions that came in from mike is uh, with the probe is there a difference in accuracy with different stylus lengths it's a good question i would probably have to refer to renishaw to speak like fully on it from my experience a lot of it has to do with just calibration and, and the type of probe that you have so there's 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 different accuracies in the probes and then they kind of steer you in the way that you're going to use it so if you're going to use a particular stylus they might steer you in a different type of probe meaning there is a, a two-digit probe for renishaw which is you know, like an omp60 and then there's an omp600 so it's kind of a, a string gauge probe it's a little bit different mechanics inside of it how it does it so they might stare you in that depending on what type of of stylus you have so i've had experiencing accuracies of 200 millimeters in length in styluses that are just performing just like the 50 millimeter standard out of the box so when you start to get kind of high with that, they tend to tell you to go to the higher range pour, the more more accuracy probe. But yeah, we've we've taken an OMP60 and an OMP600 and put a 200 millimeter stylus on it and seen you know relatively good accuracies. But when you start putting it in like a a, a machine that the head moves around, then you probably want to 
to stick with a, a certain style of a pro. But um, yeah, the, I would say that Renishaw will probably be the best on it. But like I said before, it, it, it matters of what what probe you have versus what stylus. I think is really the answer to that question. Yeah, and I think to, to back that up, the other key is you got to make sure you recalibrate the probe radially. Because obviously, the longer the probe, the further you are from the switch, the speed at which it's moving will actually cause a look greater distance, right, for deflection. But the calibration cycle will take care of all that. I mean, obviously, yeah. you're going to have to recalibrate it anyway because you changed out the probe. It's probably not running concentric perfectly, and you have a different length, but there's where it really should start to compensate. Um, another question that came in, we could do real quick before you move on. This came from Bruce. Um, is there a way to compensate for the stylus radius when using rectangular spigot to find the part zero? The way it, it is, it sets zero above the part by the radius of the stylus. So I think what Bruce is referring to is a scenario where the probe could be commissioned to work for center of the radius as opposed to the contact edge. So what I would ask you, Dan, and we could validate that real quick on this machine, um, you set the top of your part, we watched you measure a G54 right on the top of that blank, right? And you didn't do any compensation, correct? So no. if, I, if you position the, the, the probe with G54 to XYZ zero, will it be touching the block? That's a good question, so let's do that. We do have the probe in this window. We do not. So we'll go to jog here. Tool change in the probe. This is what's really cool about this this virtual this, this my virtual machine software. It's like you're running the machine, so you can do really everything you could do on the on the real machine here. It's uh it's quite the sandbox, shall I say? Yeah, it's been fun running this thing. As someone that's programmed a lot, I was literally programming and running this at the same time and posting up programs and sitting in here. So you want to go right to zero, Z zero, right? See if we touch the part. Yeah, we want to see if we're touching. Anticlimactic. <laughs> so All right, zoom on in. Let's see where we are. And there we are. So so it definitely is a, a, a settings scenario. Uh, Bruce, this is what you're referring to. So we'll 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 get to the bottom of it on your machine. I know Bruce has been struggling with that a little bit. Okay, why don't we uh, why don't we let you get back to it again? We have a bunch more questions, but you got a lot of material to go through. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll we'll get back at it. So we're gonna go back to the presentation. So that was setting up our first off and second off work offset and using it in an auto function so when we set our work piece up and we set our our second second off up we can measure that in an auto mode we can throw that in our program we can just verify too so this is really kind of cool so next thing and really what i really wanted to go in and what topic that it comes across all the time when we talk about these manufacturing a good is can we do in process measure? How do we measure cut measure? Do we measure the tool? Or do we measure the part? How do we how do we start to comp and make sure that we can get close to nominal as possible? And that's something that I like to call or refer to as measure cut measure. And Siemens gives you a functionality in their cycles that does the math for you. And we're going to try to take you down a road of using the cycle to do the math and then doing the math yourself. Because a lot of times is you get those customers or you have a customer or you're a customer yourself and you're like, I really want to use the cycle, but I don't want it to update my tool. I want it to do it this way or this way. You kind of have it a unique way to use it. And we'll touch base on that as we go through the material. So here we're going to use that same measure hole, but we're going to use it in a tool offset and we're going to pick that tool. And then we have geometry. Either we're going to, we're going to apply the, the difference to the geometry or we're going to apply it to the wear. And then we're going to start a start angle again, protection zone is if you have something in the way and then DFA and D TSA are your search tolerances and then dimensional tolerance. So dimensional tolerance here is if you choose this and this scenario that I'm showing on the screen in my presentation is if you are above the upper limit, which is one and one and 10 microns or minus one millimeter and 10 microns, if you're above or below those two values, it will not update the tool. 
So this is kind of a cool thing of really kind of controlling that. So you don't really have to put a whole lot into this. If you're just really going to swing a ball, you're going to, you're going to, you know, he look a hole and you're going to measure that hole. And then you're going to make sure that that hole is going to be 20, 24 millimeters. Okay. So, like I said, we have the way to do it to an update a tool. Here is a measure only. So we can just go in and measure that hole. Why would you want to do that? Well, one, Maybe you just want to measure the hole and verify that you're cutting it or have it for some inspection tolerance, or you want to apply it to the tool geometry or tool wear or something that is a function on here. I don't know if anyone has heard of is TOFFL or TOFFR. These are like gold. I've used these so much over the years of doing some measure cut measure or doing some macro programming or really trying to fine tune a part or to do some automation. These are these are really cool things. Even some cool functionalities if you if in your CAM system if you want to do some simulation on your machine, these are some cool functionalities because it's really just applying an offset to that tool for that program when you command it. So what does that mean? So if you have a tool that, let's say that 12 millimeter, we're gonna use it on different features of the part and we're gonna finish different features and we don't want that tool to be comped in there. Back in the day, you'd have like multiple work offsets for one tool and you're gonna try to figure out, am I gonna use D24 or H24? Or what am I gonna use for that tool? Here, we can either write it to the tool geometry or tool where by pushing it to a system variable <clears throat> or we can just use TOFFL or TOFFR length or radius in our part program. So let's say that 12 millimeters is going to key like that hole and we're going to use some, some, uh, we're using cutter comp for that. We're in G41 or G42 and we're going to use that just in that one program. And then it's going to be off. It's going to apply it to the tool. And then once that program is done, it's going to be off. So it's really kind of crucial to, and cool that you have that functionality because a lot of times you'd have to set multiple work offsets for that one tool for multiple different features. Here, you can just put it right in your program. Be done. So how do you do that, right? And that's where you're going to use the measure only cycle. And when you start to go in the measure only, you kind of kind of know where that data is going. So here, and what's cool about Siemens and Cinemaric controls is on any control, if you highlight what you're on and you hit the help key, it's going to pull up a screen. And it's going to pull up the help screen. And, and if you scroll down to the bottom of that on any measuring cycle, you're going to see this result parameters. And this is going to be where the results are going to be at. So when you're done with the cycle, it's going to put whatever it measured in one of these variables. And here we're going to look at the whole diameter here for radius. So we're going to see OVR4, and that's going to be the one that we're going to focus on. That's where our data is when we measure it. The next is we need to know, once we know where the results are gonna go, we're gonna need to use some user variables to kind of do some math for us. And we, we need that so that we kind of adapt or do some math. So we need to know we have a nominal and we measure, so we need to know that difference so we can apply it to the tool. Where are OVRs, right? So we wanna go to the tool list, user variables, and then channel new goods. And we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna try to find OVR for us. So we know what this is. So we can get out a note piece of paper and, and, and every time we measure it, write it down on a note piece of paper, or we can put it to a user variable and use it. Like I said, using the measure only function inside these cycles, we can do the math ourselves, but we need to know a new few things. And what I did here for the radius is I, I measured the tool, I measured the hole, and I put that value that I measured in a variable, R21. So every time it goes to measure, it's gonna put that value in R21 at my user variable. Then I, I know what the nominal is because I have a print, right? <clears throat> and then I gotta I need to know the difference between what I measured and the nominal. So I put that in a variable. And then once I know that, I know that I need to apply this to a radius. So I need to divide the value by two. And then this is this is a way. So once I know the difference, I know what I need to comp my tool on. I have it in a variable, I can just put it in TOFFR equals R23. And I could put this in any program that I'm using that feature. I want to use that, or I know that my, my half inch end mill or my 12 millimeter end mill is trending a little bit smaller because they tend to do. You can tend to put that in any program you want, or you can apply it to the, the, the wear or geometry of the, the tool. So you can either do that in the cycle or you can do that out. 
So one of the biggest things that we're going to talk about in length comp, measure cut measure, and radius comp is, and you're doing it outside the cycle, is the machine doesn't know what tool is. You got to tell it what tool and what offset. So you can't just say apply it to 12 millimeter end. And the big thing about Siemens is we have a couple different ways to describe tools. We can describe it with a number, so T1, T2, T3, right? Or we can describe it with a name. We can say 12 millimeter underscore EM or N mil, right? And with that, we need to know where the offset is. What Siemens does, it has an internal tool number, right? And you need to know that internal tool number to apply that offset if you're doing it with system variables. So how do you do that? We got a handy little function called get. And with that, you can get and apply the tool name and it'll get the tool number. So here I'm writing the tool number to R20, <clears throat> right? I'm finding that. And then I'm going to apply that, that, that the difference, right? The compensation of my radius value from the math I did up here to the where, right? This, TC dollar sign TC underscore DB 15 is describing for the internal tool number of 12 millimeter underscore EM. And then we're going to equal our difference in radius. So this is kind of a unique function. So this is kind of going kind of high level of how we can do it. The reason why I wanted to show this is a lot of times you're probably going to go down this TOFFR or writing it to aware or something like that. And you don't necessarily have it cut and dry just in the cycle and you'll see that with like a z touch because a lot of times you might not have it in the perfect world where you can just use the cycle and this is a kind of way to kind of use it outside the cycle okay so we can kind of go through that and dive through that i don't want to run out of time here so i'm going to try to go through this as quickly as i can so i wrote the program we have the radius here so we're gonna again i wrote some variables to drive the machine to home We'll change in the probe and here we're we're on the we're on the edge of the part so i'm going to run this while i talk the program so i'm going to actually start to cut the part and we're actually going to talk about the program so here's my cutting program right and we're going to let that run and i'm going to go into the probing program so it's going to do its thing while it's doing its thing we're going to talk about the probing program so Like I said, I did some variables to send the machine home, did a safety line, and I drove the machine to a, a position. We'll take the vertical, right? I'm gonna use cycle 800 to drive the machine to a position, right? And here I'm gonna drive the machine to B axis 90, and then I'm going to probe the hole. Now, this is something very unique to Siemens. We're actually, probing not vertically in this machine. We're actually driving it to a position and we're actually gonna probe it. So here is where we're doing our tool offset. We're gonna to apply it to the wear and we're starting at zero angle, two millimeters and two millimeters, and we're applying some dimensional tolerances. So if we go above or below those upper and lower tolerances, it will not affect the tool. And like I said before here, I wrote it to some user variables just to do the math for us, and I'm not applying it because I'm doing it inside the cycle. Okay. So once I go to execute this, right, did my machining. So now it's going to come in and probe that hole, right? So all I did is the probe was in there and it probed the hole. Now, if we go to that tool, which is the 12 millimeter tool, right? Right here, here's our 12 millimeter. So we got 150 and our, our radius is six, but if we go to the wear, right? It's right there, it's, it's, it's tracking negative. So one of the things that we need to know is, okay, so it applied the feature. It applied some, some top to that tool, right? If we go back to our user variables, tool list, our variables, and we look at, we look at our tool R21 where I wrote the whole RV variable, right? Which is, it's seeing, okay, it's, it's under, 24 millimeters, so what the hole should be, right? And then I did the math down here, and then I see, you see it's like 102. So it looks like the machine kind of rounded up a little bit. Okay, so 103 is what I put it in, okay? So we know what our comp is. So now what do we do is we have actually gonna have to go and remachine those holes, right? So we're in a, in a scenario where measure cut measure, right? So 
I'm going to, I did that. So I just wanted to show you that. And I'm going to zero this out again. And I have a program where we're going to measure, cut measure, right? So we're calling the probe program up. We're going to cut the part again with the comp and we're going to measure it again. So we're going to get that result. So we're going to execute this. Come in and we're going to turn the tool out. So now you see here we have some comp value and we've got G41 on. And now we're going to have that probe come out. And we wanted to get to 24 millimeters. That was the goal. That was our nominal goal that we were trying to get to. So here we're coming in and measuring that again, right? <clears throat> if we go back to the R variable where we were, we wrote, oh, look, our measure cut measure. So we're seven microns over. So we look at our print. We're definitely within tolerance. We, we achieved our measure cut measure and we hit our 24 millimeters. So that's how we would apply a measure cut measure strategy inside the program, outside the program, pushing it to geometry or where. So that's that's radius. This is something that I think is huge. And one of the big takeaways too is we can do it vertically. We did it in, 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 a, in a five axis, almost in a five axis way. We, we rotated the B axis, we rotated the C axis. It didn't have to be vertical. This is really a key point to drive home how we can use our cycles, okay? So back to our presentation. Now we're gonna do the same thing in the end. And this is following the same thing. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through this because I don't wanna take much of your time today. And I really wanna get through this, get to the meat of the, of the, of the, how to result this. So again, measure length. We're gonna do it the same way. Pick a, a tool, we're gonna to apply it to the wear. There's a one key thing that we, is different from a, a hole to, uh, excuse me, to uh, just doing an, an edge is you need to know where you're measuring to. So here we need to know where the Z zero is to where we're touching Z to that edge touch. So you need to know if you're touching an X, Y, or Z, where the zero is, where G54 is lying when you go to measure, okay? And again, we're going to pick that. We need to know the distance from zero and then the safe, and then we can do an upper and lower tolerance to say if you're going to apply to the tool or not. Okay. So on our part, right? We have our part and we see that the thickness of our part is 39 millimeters, right? <clears throat> and we're going to lay that part down B90, right? So Z is going to be in the middle of the part, right? It's the middle of our block, middle of our part, right? And we know that Z is going to be pointing up when we rotate down because one of the functions of cycle 800 is it always really wants to get normal to the spindle, making sure that the, you are normal to the spindle and you have G17 normal to the spindle, right? <clears throat> You're working in that plane. So we're going to come down and touch the thickness of this part. With the cycle, it's just one touch. And really the biggest thing to drive home is you can you can option in the cycle. So the distance from zero and what that discrepancy is from the distance from zero. Here, we might wanna to touch two points, right? And that's where we're gonna drive home the point of maybe doing some of the math outside the cycle to do a measure cut measure, right? So, oh, sorry. This is where we might just do a measure only right into some variables and either use it and push it to the tool geometry or to TFFR. So in my cycle, I actually hit two points that I'm using measure cut. The first scenario, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna comp in the cycle, but here I'm gonna show you how you do two points, right? Here, we do the first one and I take the OVR4, right? For my measure results and I write it to a variable. Then I swing the machine to another position, 180 degrees around. I, I turn C axis and I touch another point and I write that to a different variable. Now I have both points. I have both points. I've measured the distance of my part while B was at 90 degrees. I know the thickness of my part now. I know of where I'm at, 39 millimeters. So I'm going to actually take those two touches. I'm going to add them together and I'm going to minus it for my nominal, make sure that I'm tracking, right? And if I wanted to update the tool, I have to go one step further because it's a distance, linear distance. I need to divide it by two and, and apply that to my, my, the end of my tool or that the length of my tool. Again, two really crucial, I can't crucial 
and stress this enough, you need to find the internal tool number. A lot of times guys go through this and they're like, I don't know why I'm not updating my work offset. Well, it's because you didn't find the internal tool number. So you really want to really want to drive the point home, making sure that internal tool number is there. And I kind of show you where that is on the machine. Again, applying it to once I put it to a variable, I apply that difference here and then it, we go to the machine. So we can go to that, that demo here. So we have our length program here so drive the machine to a position that i dictated as my home position i super there some safety lines tool change in the probe what work offset i'm on i'm doing the first work offset and then i'm setting my position on my spindle and i'm cyclate huntering to a position driving to a point i'm going to touch and then i'm going to go right into my z touch so i'm updating the tool wear here right and I'm going to, I know that half of 39, because I'm doing a Z-touch is 19.5, right? So that's going to be that my difference, right? Except that I'm writing it to a variable, first one, then I'm cyclate hundreding, turning the part 180 degrees, and I'm going to Z-touch again, right? Same thing. We know that we're going to be half the distance because Z is going to be in the center of the part. And then I'm doing the math to do that, right? And then I'm updating the tool. So if we do that in a scenario where I have my tool here, right, it's a two inch tool, where we at? two inch face, right? And we look at the where, we got nothing in there, right? So if we go and run a measure cut measure, and I'm gonna do this just in my program I created. So here I have created a program. I call the first one up and then I call the finishing of both sides up and then I measure it again. So when we run this, we're gonna do measure cut measure, just like I said in the webinar. We run it, it's gonna apply the tool. <clears throat> so we're gonna move it 180 degrees. Now we have that known distance, right? We're gonna come in and finish, right? And if we go look at that tool really quick, we have some cop on that tool. So we have quite a bit of cop in the length and we're gonna come in and measure that. And again, it was 39 millimeters that we wanted to achieve. So there was some compensation in there. <clears throat> so we're going to try to achieve that. And if we go to that, that OVR4, or we go to our R variable where we wrote it, right? We're going to see 39 millimeters in four microns. So we achieved that measure cut measure. Okay. Um, let's, for a second, let me go back to the part. So what I was wanting to stress, just so I talked about the internal tool number. So if you go to any tool here, right? I want to kind of touch base on this. If you go over to details, there's this internal detail, right? And once you go to internal detail, here's the tool number that really is describing this tool. That's where you're going to use that git command. It's really, really, really important that you do, okay? That is how you're going to apply it to the offset when you're pushing to variables. Okay. And one thing to keep in mind there, you know, earlier you talked about whether you're using a tool as a number or a name, there's always an internal tool number. So if you call the tool number five, the internal tool number isn't number five. It could yeah. be, but there's a high probability it's not. We create those randomly when you build the tool. So it's super important what Dan's showing you here on how to how to find that internal tool number and then use it when you start to do these kinds of processes. All right, so back to my presentation, I'm gonna do a little bit more live demonstration and then we'll wrap up with some questions. So one of the biggest things is you see me jump around, did a measure cut measure, I jumped around, I went to my R variables, I'm looking at this. The name of the game of it always comes across is that's super cool and it's super crucial and we always use that, but how do we track it? How do we get it? Like, where, where do we find the data? How we, can we get that data? Can we get it off the machine? Can we have a report? Well, we have you covered. Siemens has you covered. There's a couple different ways. Like I said before, we give you 10 different ways of doing it. So one of the, we're going to cover two. Okay. One of the biggest things I think would be used and what's really cool is there's a write command and the write command pretty much puts it out to a text file and you can write that text file any which way you want. You can push whatever you want. You want to push a variable. You want to push the OVR variable. You want to push anything that you want to push to this file. You can do it and it's consecutive. So every time you run it, 
it's going to have a consecutive running. And uh, I'll show you, I had it in my program so we can kind of see that consecutive run. Next, in John or auto mode is this, this result, right? Measure results. So I talked about a button in the beginning about JOG. And we can either have a basically a CSV format or a text format. And these are how the reports are actually going to come out, either in JOG or in auto mode using a cycle 150, right? So that's really kind of cool. Again, it can be consecutive, right? Or it can create a new report every single time. Like I said before, in JOG, we have text format or CSV, and it this is where you set up where you're going to set that that file that's going to go to it. And then in our in our part program, we have cycle 150. This is really kind of cool. So let's go to the live demo. So each one of those programs, I kind of grazed over it because I wanted to get through the topic. And each one of those part programs, I had both those in there. So we had both ways of describing the radius. So here I had 150. So all I did is I, I put the cycle 150 in there. So you go here, measure workpiece, measure results, right? We're going to put that in there. And then here on NC start, we're going to create it as a log standard report. It's going to be the text format and it's applying it to that, that directory. And this is the name. So if we go to that right now. I did this, right? We go to that, we go to that directory. I have radius 24 millimeters. So we go in there and then here's our report, right? This is our report. We, we're 20, 24 and eight microns, right? really kind of cool it has a lot of data here what time you were what tool what the where of the tool is what where we're copying the tool now where we're at comparing to what it is right <clears throat> so it's kind of really 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 cool really handy same thing in the length right so we go back to our length program i also had the same thing i had cycle here and i put it before my two touches right same thing describing it to what directory and if we go to that, that directory and we look at that report, really kind of unique. We have our tool, we have the difference that it copped it at, and then we have our two touches, like the difference in touches that we are, right? And this is after we measured, right? We measured this and we're getting, we're getting really close to our center of our part, right? Because these are two touches. So we're trying to achieve that. So we needed 19.5, so we're at 19.52 and 19.2. So really a big difference from where we were. You can have that be a log file and continuous inside the cycle. When we go back to that program here, go down to that cycle, it can be continuous, right? We can have new or we can have a append. So what that'll do is be a continuous. I keep putting in each hit, each, each update, right? let's say you have some custom and it doesn't really follow that report and you're not using the measure psych you're not using the cycle to update your tool and you want to know some things about it and this is where that write function comes into play so we have this write function and what we're doing here is i'm writing to um to a file and then i'm going to set the name of my part and then i'm i'm inside that file i'm doing part length and then i'm describing what my measure result is and this is every single time I hit cycle start, this right, it hits this right command, it's gonna push whatever I want into that file. And I think this is really cool. So this is something that I use all the time to push variables into a file to remember what I'm doing, right? So if we go to that file that I created, I filed two, one for length and one for radius, we can even see that consecutive hit, right? So I ran this before the webinar and obviously I was trending, but for when, it, when we did the trending from the start, we were 45 millimeters. So we're almost six millimeters off of nominal. And then we cut the part again, and now we we're, almost, we're four microns off of nominal. So that's something that you can do. So I, this is something that's very custom that you can kind of do, and you can kind of push anything to this. We could have pushed the OVR for variable to this, and that could have been what we measured every single time. And then with the radius, we have the capability of doing it too. Right, we were, we we're, we weren't that far off on the radius, but then once we ran it again, now we're, we're seven microns off the nominal. So this is something that you can kind of push, and these are two two different ways you can start to track that information. You can actually start to track how you're doing your measure cut measure. 
this is something that you can do even when you're G54, you can start to push some of these work offsets to make sure that how far and what your trending data is for where you're moving your part is and how your part's being moved. Okay. All right, this leads us to our questions. Just want to reiterate before we get into it, the questions. Um, Chris's contact and my contact, if, if anything comes up and you watch this again or it goes on YouTube, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out with us and anything that you wanted to cover more on, on this topic so we can get into the questions, Chris. Perfect. Well, great job, Dan. A lot of, a lot of awesome information, and I can see that by the questions we have. So we're, uh, we're, I'm going to be bouncing between a couple of different screens here because we have some of them in the chat, some of them in the Q&A. Uh, if I do miss your question, it wasn't intentional, uh, and you can always use that contact information to reach out to us. Um, do, 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 let's get to where it was. Um, okay, so Will was asking, and this was pretty early on in the content, would it be better to use uh, two holes for alignment in this situation? So I'm assuming he might be talking about when you were doing the align edge. Yeah, there, there you can do that. Uh, sometimes, like in this situation, this is ideal to use. You could use two. You can use two edges. A lot of times, it's just where you have the feature. Like maybe there would have been a clamp here, right? Maybe there been something in there that we couldn't do two holes. This is where you have the edge. I tend to go with the rule of thumb, the easiest to not drive the probe into something the best way. So here there's there's really nothing in the way. And so I have to really make sure that we get it like, you know, maybe maybe there was a way in this fixture there wasn't a lot of constraint where you could have this part really skewed in here. So then two holes probably wouldn't be the best way. So you, you have a tight squeeze to drive that probe in here. Here it's all open. So there's nothing really in the way to hit the two points. But yeah, you could you could do two holes. Okay, uh, and when I would um, actually add to that, um, what you do also have to keep in mind, though, two holes uh, for an align edge we have in jog, but we don't have in auto mode. So if you are going to do it, you're going to have to do the math. You can measure the center of the two holes, but you're going to have to do the calculation. Uh, we don't have a standard cycle for doing a line edge from two holes in auto, just in jog. Don't know why, it's always been like that. Okay, um, do, 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 where was I? So this is more of a statement from Ken. Uh, the longer stylus, when we were talking about the, the size of the stylus, will impact accuracy and re repeatability uh, as longer stylus have more pre-travel variation due to bending. Um, so I, I would agree with that. Obviously, there are certainly a lot of different materials styluses are made out of that can affect that. However, as long as we calibrate and we're measuring at the same velocity, we should have a predictable deviation that we can compensate for, right? But but yes, anything, you go longer, it's always going to have some impact. Um, Dave was asking, what's the recommendation for periodic probe calibration intervals? Chris, you could probably back me up on this. I have a kind of a rule. If you take the tool, uh, if you take the probe out of the, the machine tool, 100% calibrate on every stylus change or or you break a stylus, uh, that's definitely warrants a, a calibration. And then I would say, as you start to see things trending a little bit, I, I would say maybe my rule of thumb is if you see some indiscrepancies, that's when you really want to calibrate. But maybe every month, maybe every other month. Uh, it, as long as you're not taking the probe out of the machine and you're not breaking styluses, uh, I would say every other month. Yeah, I would I would back you up with that. I would almost even say a lot of it will depend on your processes and even how accurately you're trying to utilize this. I'll be honest, I'm super lazy. And a lot of times I'm just using my probe to set a quick zero, find the center of my block. So, and I'm machining all those surfaces anyway. So if I was even a half of that off, it's not going to matter. So, so I may go six months between calibrating a probe. But if you're using it for this kind of processes, you're using it for inspection purposes, you're going to want to calibrate it significantly more frequently. Um, okay. Uh, doo -doo. Um, 
So this uh, this is a, a, an interesting question. Um, can you give an example of where making a probing program with the MEJ command without using our cycles, like using G631 in a FANUC? So have you done anything with the MEJ command? I have not. Okay, so you want me to field this one? Because I have played around with it a little bit. Yeah. So the mesh command is actually the root command that we use in our cycles. So it is literally the function that says, hey, I want to start searching in a direction. And then when I see a trigger from a probe, I'm going to stop. And it does nothing more than that. I mean, it's not going to do, it is real rudimentary. It is the base level command. So at that point, you then have to go into the system variables, grab the, the current position you're at, decide what you're going to do with it. So what I would say, honestly, we have such a broad portfolio of cycles. I very rarely have to use the mesh command for doing traditional kind of measuring tests. I usually will find that we certainly have a cycle for it. Now, there are cases like we were talking about, like the align edge off two holes or whatever, where I may have to use a primitive cycle and then do some measurements and do some calculations, but I still didn't need to use the mesh command by itself. I could, I could use the cycles, capture the OVRs like Dan's talking about, do a little math on them, and then come up with my result. Um, I will usually use the mesh command if I'm just trying to understand it, so I'm mimicking cycles. Or you could use the mesh command because you did not buy cycles. Um, you can do, you, you do not need the license. I probably shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> not that it matters. Um, you do not need the license for the mesh commands and that functionality. It just gives you access to our cycles. That's all. So if you happen to find yourself on a machine that doesn't have the cycles um, or maybe doesn't support them, a good scenario of that is the 808. We don't have, we didn't develop measuring cycles for the 808, but the mesh command still works. So, you, so an OEM could build them, the user could build them. So that's kind of where I would say we could use it or not. Um, Pat came in and asked, how do we find the dollar sign TC underscore 15 to find the tool? So I think he's talking about probably the tool carrier variable. Dan, you want to field that? And what would you just, what would your best way of uh, describing? Oh boy, opened up a lot of windows there. What would, what would your best course of action is? I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about finding the internal tool number, right? Yeah. Is he talking about that or one of the other? Because there's a couple paths, right? There's a lot of different variables um, for the tools and for the whole system. And if you're specifically looking on just finding all of the different variables that are associated with tools, we have a manual called the System Variables Manual. It's like the Bible for this stuff. So, Pat, if that's what you're asking, uh, and you want to access that man, I'll shoot either myself or Dan an email. We can send it to you. Um, but if I'm just looking for the internal tool number and I want to be down and dirty, I would do exactly what you showed them earlier. I would go to that internal data screen and just look it up right there. Or you can use the get T command like you were showing to automate that process. But keep in mind with get T, you're getting the tool number. Uh, were you using it with the name? You were, right? Because yeah. the other thing you can do is there's a variable, P tool variable, I forget the full syntax, that you can also just capture the internal tool number for whatever's sitting in your spindle. Then you wouldn't yeah. have to push the name of the tool in. So there are a few different ways to do it. But if you're looking for descriptions of all of those variables, system variable manual, no doubt. That's where you want to go. Um Jack had an interesting question regarding um, kind of mimicking this functionality you're showing in a CAM system like MasterCAM or Fusion or another one. Uh, so what he was saying, is there a cycle in MasterCAM or Fusion or other CAD systems that will produce the, the, the code or macros we are seeing, or is this all by hand process? And I did back that up asking Jack, was he talking about the measuring cycles or more of your logic commands and whatnot? And he was referring to the logic commands. Uh, so do you want to talk to that or you want me to? Yeah, I can talk to that. So I have quite a little bit of background in that, um, something that I've been doing, working with CAN systems over the years. This is kind of unique to what, um, so you said the macro process, right, Chris? Yes. 
So that is kind of unique to this software. So as far as uh, SimuTrain or um, to create my virtual machine, using the control here is really kind of unique to that. As far as as I've seen is we can do some of this stuff in, in like an NX. I don't believe Mastercam or Fusion has a way to push or pull variables, but a lot of this is just gonna be hand coded. You can't be able to see some of this R variables push up, but you can have that set in like an NX or that before, but it's gonna be perfect. You know what I mean? Here, we're kind of seeing it in an environment where we, we've seen some changes. So if we go to those R variables, we're seeing some changes here that have happened in the cam system. They're going to be really perfect. They're going to be perfect numbers every single time because it's sitting in a perfect world and in a perfect environment. So in NX, there's actually a way when you're using machine code that you actually can set some variables that you can monitor. But really, all this would probably be hand coded inside the cam system to do it. And then you wouldn't be able to see any of the variables update. Perfect. Um, Patrick did go back in and say he was asking about the internal tool number. And then Dave jumped in and remembered uh, or knew the, the variable off the top of head that I was trying to remember. It's dollar sign P underscore tool N O. So T O L L N O. So that is an alternative of the get T command where it'll just grab whatever the internal tool number of the tool that's in the spindle. So that's a, that's a super handy variable. Um, we Kumar wrote, uh, can we do a webinar like this using an L probe? I think that's a that's a great idea, Dan. We should definitely put that on the list. Um, I would say that might be a better one for YouTube Live, so we could have a, like a, a legit L probe on our on our one of the machines in the uh, in the decks there. Uh, So uh, Jack said, very nice presentation from you, Dan. Uh, please send out the link. Uh, yeah, we'll get all that. Um, how do we get this Create My Virtual Machine software? Um, so that is our latest variation of simulation software. Originally, you guys are probably used to SinuTrain. Um, so My Virtual Machine is replacing SinuTrain. It's specific to Cinemark 1 as far as how we're marketing and using it. Uh, it does use a new file format. Uh, previously, we used set files to create these custom machines. Now they're VCP files. However, it is possible to build machines um, even from the older legacy stuff. But for the most part now, um, it's really going to be coming if you're purchasing Cinemark 1 controls, and then the OEM can actually sell you the VCP file. Uh, but it is, uh, it's definitely a very, uh, very strong piece of software that uh, we see going to get much more traction in the market space, I would say. Um, okay, so now let me jump down to the Q&A side, because that was just in the chat window. All right. Um, so what is the accuracy of simulation as the probe was not calibrated? Um, also, are there uh, demonstrations of a multi-tip probe? So uh, similar to like the L probe. So we will uh, we will get into that. We have not, um, but um, the the probe is actually calibrated within the software. Now there could be some discrepancy based on velocity. Um, this whole thing works in the virtual environment um, by the collision detection. So when it sees the probe collide, that's what's giving us our trigger. Um, but the tools in this environment, keep in mind, are perfect, right? So if I create a half-inch tool, it's perfectly a half-inch tool. It's not, and, and what you're trying to fix on the floor is either the tool's not really the right size, right? Or I got some uh, machining, outside machining deflection or environmental conditions that's causing me to deviate from my part size. That's going to be difficult stuff to obviously show in this process, but uh, but you do have to go through a full calibration process of the probe. Um, Paul asked, uh, I can see this is the new Cinemark One control. Yep. Um, what are the simulation options available for the older Cinemark A40, 457, 48, 49 versions? I assume there are multiple requirements. So as we kind of briefly just stated. Um, SinuTrain is still the current version of software for simulation purposes, um, or you have VNCK, 
um, that's something I don't think we've shown in a webinar. Um, that's an interesting scenario where we can have the full machine space model simulation and connection to um, our archives inside of NX. So that's something you could always look at if you're interested, reach out. Um, but you can, it is possible, as I mentioned, um, the machine you're looking at, that's an 840 machine. I built that uh, from data I pulled out of it. So, um, but you can probe in the older sinew train. The only thing you got to keep in mind, since there was no real collision avoidance per se, um, the probing would just simulate a trigger. So it would always go the same distance and say, oh, I hit, and it really didn't. But you could still use it to validate your processes. All right, here's another good one um, for you, Dan. Does coolant concentration affect probing accuracy? I like that one. Yeah, that's kind of unique. Um, depending on the probe that you use, meaning what kind of what manufacturer probe I think will probably be the answer to that question. So meaning that there are multiple different manufacturers of probe. There's Bloom, there's Renishaw, there's uh, it's, uh, a couple different ones out of the market, but between Renishaw and Bloom, this would be kind of the interesting thing there. If you have really kind of thick, you know, coolant, it could really be, it could really kind of affect it. But sometimes I, I found even with tools and with, with parts that chips probably have more of an effect than coolant does, especially on a Renishaw probe, because I think a pro, it's going to have a physical touch. But I don't think as far as the concentricity is, is going to affect the probe accuracy. I have seen where like oil on a surface has, has done it, uh, depending on what manufacturer probe you have. But I haven't really seen it. More chips come into play. So in this scenario that I did a measure cut measure, we might maybe add a fan if we're starting to see some load of some chips. Uh, but yeah, I, I haven't seen where the, if the concentricity is, is, is high or low, that it's going to affect that probe hit. There's, okay. Yeah. Uh, Paul wrote, um, this part's uh, limited as a 3 plus 2 part, not 5 axis part. In the future, it would be good to see a blade or a bliss. I would agree. We can certainly put that on the list of, of upcoming events. Um, how would I use this process to measure the outside diameter of a sphere? This was from Don. So you have like a ball at the end of the part? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Like a sphere? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I only could assume he's talking about that he measured a sphere um, or a machine to sphere, and then he wants to kind of QC the geometry of the sphere. Is what I'm thinking. So in our standard cycles, the answer to that question, I think you would use like a, a rectangle spigot or a spigot to find the outside of that part. So you're obviously knowing kind of where that sphere is sitting, the center of it. And then from there, you're gonna apply that to an R variable at the diameter that you can, uh, you know, either if you're using 3D cutter comp or if you're using cutter comp to do that, or Z if you're using the tip of, tip of a ball to interpolate that sphere. It all depends on how you're really machining that sphere to, to, to comp it. But just like I did, Inside the probing here on the screen, we have that the radius. You would do the math probably outside that cycle to either apply it to the the tip of the tool or the radius of the tool. All right. Here's another one from Paul. Observation from my side. Based on the faceting of the STL in the simulation, is there an adjustment that improves the deviation? This could be done in NX software with simulation to get it repeatable to 12 place decimals. So I'm assuming he's talking about the faceting on the machine surface. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yes, there, there's a little faceting to it. Um, in this software, I do not know of any way to affect that uh, deviation of that faceting. Um, certainly in the, in the machine model, that's all behavior of when we build the STLs. Um, but that STL obviously is being created 
from the machining process. So that's a good question, Paul. I, I would have to look into that. To my knowledge, I don't know of, of, a, of a variable for that, but there, there certainly could be. Um, Yeah, then, he, then Paul was saying, they will not be perfect in NX. If you're doing retouch probing, there are multiple factors involved into it. Okay. Um, all right, what else do we have? Um, this is an FYI from Kurt. In our testing of Run My Virtual Machine, we're seeing a max of 5% difference in time estimates using the generic VCB file compared to running the same program on the physical machine. Uh, it's a great tool for estimating jobs. Yeah, and I would even say that 5% they're seeing is probably all tool change based. Um, usually that's um, the one thing you can actually, we can go as far in this software as fully, um, fully realize the tool changer but it takes a lot of additional development. So most of the time when you see these machines built, um, they're either not even taking into account tool change time, like a chip to chip scenario, or they've estimated and put some some delays or dwells in to mimic it, but it's never gonna be accurate, right? Because it would have to then change that amount of time based on how many pockets the tool changer has to rotate and all that. Um, so usually if we see any deviation, that's where it comes from. Um, Okay, I think I got everybody, but again, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, if I missed anything, by all means, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Dan. Dan, I want to thank you again for doing a great job. Awesome webinar. I uh, look forward to sucking you back in and having you do some more in the future. So yeah. thank you, thank you. And uh, thanks everybody for, for joining. And uh, we certainly appreciate the support, the attendance, great engagement, great conversation. And we look to see look forward to seeing everybody real soon. So with that, have a great weekend and we'll talk to you when we talk to you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.